This is Siddharth Alwalia. Welcome to the 100x Entrepreneur Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Prime Venture Partners, an early stage VC fund led by Amit Swamani, Shripati Acharya and Sanjay Swami. Prime is often the first institutional investor in category creating tech startups in fintech, SaaS, healthcare and education such as MoneyTap, Happy, Mfine. To know more about Prime, visit primevp.in. Today we have with us Dhruv Kapoor Dhruv is partner with Systema Asia Capital and has over 18 years of experience in investing in e-commerce, internet, mobile and financial services. Dhruv, welcome to the podcast. Hi Siddhar, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to the podcast. Good to be here. Uh, Dhruv, we'd love to know about your journey from Delhi University to becoming a venture capitalist and how did you manage initially to get into McKinsey and then Helion? Yeah so you know once i completed my my graduation from delhi university i decided to work i actually joined the banking sector very early on in my career uh, abn ambro bank at that point in time ran an all india examination to hire at an officer grade and i was one of the four that uh, that joined them in 1999 i also was the youngest employee in all of abn ambro so as lucky that very early on in my career i got to work with a top tier bank abn at that point in time was a pretty much a wholesale banking uh, focused enterprise and during that time during my stay there they had also acquired uh, bank of america's retail business so i got exposure both on the wholesale side as well as on the retail side um i spent about 2 years there and towards the end of my stay at abn amro I was uh, managing their uh, import payment desk for large enterprises. So, you know, very early got some got to dirty my hands uh, on the operating side. After two and a half years, I decided to pursue my MBA, and then post my MBA, uh, found myself uh, uh, in McKinsey. Uh, this was uh, this was on their research and knowledge side. So I. joined them um, in 2004 in their gurgaon office and given my background in the banking i uh, you know i found myself in the financial services practice and so uh, so i leveraged that experience and worked with clients both in india as well as uh, as the united states i split my time between these two places uh, i think what mckinsey gave me was a very good platform uh, as part of my work i was also a part of the mckinsey's benchmarking project um on the asset management side and uh, and uh, uh, i actually got to interact with top 100 asset managers uh, both in us and canada as part of that project so that gave me um, good insights into the investment management field Now, having spent four years at McKinsey, I was looking for the next challenge. I kind of realized that I had slotted myself in a particular sector too early on, so I was looking to broad base. And given my experience in the investment management field, I got interested uh, in the broader private equity venture capital space. And uh, and at, it was serendipity. At that point in time, that uh, Helion also was looking to hire somebody. at a junior level because Helion had set shop in 2006 and uh, after the partners uh, and a couple of early employees they were looking to hire an analyst and that's how i find my my way to my hill to Helion that's a fantastic journey bro uh, you have spent good time with Helion which has been a 600 million dollar fund that's a pretty large fund seeing you know the india of 2010 2015 you have sold over 1000 deals and were part of investments at helion like azure power easy tap mo engage rail yatri whoopla how was your experience working with helion and at what stage did you invest in these companies so helion was a very different ball game uh, compared to mckinsey uh, what i liked about helion was that again uh, you know early on in my career i got to work with a stellar group of partners who had prior experience in building scaling and exiting companies uh they were partners who had built large scale uh, bpo businesses and exited them very successfully uh to large enterprises 
there were people on the technology side that had built technology businesses and sold to companies like Amazon in the 80s. And there were big people who had worked uh, largely in the consumer brand space. So for me, as a junior person, to work with all these partners and work uh, on different deals that they were leading was uh, an experience to cherish. Um, I, uh, you know, when I joined Helion, I remember the first deal that I worked on was Azure Power. Uh, nothing to do with financial services. This was a solar photovoltaic power generation company. Um, this was a founder who had no uh, working experience in the solar photovoltaic world, but he understood that space better than most analysts that cover this sector. We were impressed by him um, and his thought process. We actually stepped up to lead the seed round in Azure Power. And over the journey of that investment, we attracted capital from, from investors like IFC and Foundation Capital and a bunch of DFIs. And eventually, uh, you know, over an eight, nine uh, period uh, journey uh, with the company, the company actually listed on NYSC. Uh, so that was a that was a great experience uh, overall um, with the company. And and you know, working with different partners, uh, I just got exposure to many different sectors, many different stages, many different themes, and many different working styles. Helion was a early to mid stage. Fund. Uh, so they straddled across uh, seed, series A and series B. So, uh, so again, like I said, uh, you know, it was good to see uh, deals from many different lenses. Uh, so seed deals brought their own set of uh, characteristics versus a series B deal. Out of the deals that I worked on, you know, Azure Power was a seed deal. Um, Mo Engage was a seed deal. Um, uh, Easy Tap was a Series B deal, for example, and then Boopler and Rail Yatri were Series A. So I did work across, uh, you know, multiple stages. In addition, you know, uh, this was a time when a lot of uh, consumer services, financial services, retail services uh, opportunities were in focus. So we ended up investing in restaurant chains, in microfinance institutions. Uh, and other such services businesses and I did get the exposure to work uh, in these deals as well. So the experience was very enriching and uh, and I actually spent, ended up spending a bulk of my career there. I spent eight years with Helion from 2008 to 2016. When it was such a fantastic journey, why did you decide uh, to leave Helion and join Systema? You know, eight years was a very interesting time to to learn a lot of things from these partners and uh, and to you know really dirty my hands uh, in a lot of deals i was looking for the next challenge i wanted to uh, aggregate all my learnings and and apply that to a platform where uh, where i could sort of nurture it uh, from the from the ground zero um Systema at that point in time was still an operating entity uh, in India. They were running the MTS platform and they were they had just started thinking about what next to do in India. And Venture was an idea that they were pursing, pursing around with. Uh, they had also come to meet Helion and we had some exchange of ideas. So when they decided to launch a venture fund. And, and just to clarify, Sistema's venture fund was not a corporate venture fund. It was built and designed like a financial institution, financial VC. Uh, it seemed like the right platform where I could see myself add a lot of value. I could see myself, uh, you know, put in the foundations of, uh, of a venture capital firm. What should be the investment philosophy? What should be the guiding principles? What stage should we focus on? What sectors should we look at? What should be our portfolio construction? What should be our return profile? So all those, uh, and, and then really, you know, get to a stage where I could be uh, in a position to lead sectors, lead deals, be on the boards of those companies, manage those investments over the next 10 years, and then nurture them via an exit. So it seemed like the right platform. And, uh, and so, yeah, that's when I decided that... Um, uh, I need to use and aggregate all my knowledge that I've learned over the past 8-12 years. 
and uh, and deploy that in a new entity so there was a little bit of an entrepreneurial bug in me as well uh, which uh, culminated in my joining systema in 2016 can you tell us more about systema i believe this is a uh, russian conglomerate which built a fund in india and uh, uh, would love to know about systema's journey so yeah so systema um, is a large russian conglomerate we like to call them as the tatas of russia they have operations in about 18 sectors and these vary from uh, telecom to financial services to retail healthcare paper and pulp etc etc in india systema had a joint venture with sham group and they were running the mts telecom operations for about 10 years and you know we know how the telecom story ended for a lot of the players so they also uh, wrapped up their business somewhere in 2016 and uh, and decided to exit uh, the telecom business but while they were here they built a lot of equity and network with the startup community a lot of early stage companies would reach out to them to tap into the balance sheet uh, and to uh, you know uh, form uh, business partnerships and so uh, systema at the parent level decided that we need to have a play in india and we need to learn from the indian ecosystem so uh, in india and russia and germany they launched a string of uh, venture funds venture funds and private equity funds so we were beneficiaries of one of that uh, theme we started this fund in 2016 with a focus on mid stage investments we looked at the landscape fairly deeply and realized that while early stage has a lot of established brands uh and late stage has a lot of capital in terms of softbank and dsts and all those guys the real mid stage uh of series b and early series c was still nascent there were a handful of players operating there but uh, but but there was a need for a dedicated series b player in the market and so we uh, set ourselves to uh, establish us in that segment also um, you know systema's pedigree uh, and dna is to help companies scale and so you know that coincided well with our mid stage strategy so we look at companies where product market fit has been established where there's evidence of uh, you know monetization or business model evolution but we like our money to go towards helping companies scale uh, so really take them from 10x to 50x or 100x so that's the space or the stage that we like in terms of uh, in terms of sectors we are fairly agnostic uh, we look at anything that is technology or technology enabled and these could be you know businesses in fintech health tech edutech etc etc enterprise software and saas as well uh, our typical check sizes uh, are between 3 to 5 million in the first round and then we end up backing our companies up to 10 12 million dollars over the life of the investment uh, over these last 4 uh, years we've built a portfolio of about 10 companies we've had one exit in the form of quicksilver but most of the investments we made were in 2017 and 18 time frame so from our standpoint they're still fairly early um and our fund is uh, you know interestingly a mix of systema capital uh 80% of our lp base is systema group but the balance 20% is actually indian high net worth individuals so we were lucky to partner with about 25 high net worth individuals in india who wanted exposure to the portfolio that we'd built or were building and so so we worked closely with them uh, in the first fund so uh, let me uh, you know uh, take uh, a list through the companies of systema uh, quicksilver as you mentioned is is one of the large exits 110 million dollars to pine labs uh, whoopla mobicon netmeds pazus seclor licious lending card healthify me kisht so can you tell us about uh, uh, starting with quicksilver at what stage of valuation you entered in the company and how how did you grow the company and finally what led you thought process behind the exit 
I believe from from an exit point of view, it was still early, but a very large exit. Yeah. So interestingly, you know, I was still at Helion uh, when I had referred uh, the Quicksilver deal to Systema, and it was uh, something that my partners felt very strongly about, and they had invested in the company even before I came on board. And uh, you know, the thesis there was that uh, you know this is a gift card market is a large multi billion dollar market. in the country uh, what quicksilver had built through their managed services business was a a solution that pretty much had monopolistic characteristics they were 80 90% of the market they were powering gift card solutions for pretty much all the retailers both offline and online so it seemed like uh, and you know we were uh, it, this was uh, one of the first few deals that we did uh, so we were conscious of the risk that we were taking so this seemed like a good deal uh where downside was protected and we could really uh see about 3 4x on the upside uh from the stage at which we came in we came in uh, i think early series c in this company this was a internal round that the investors were doing and we joined that internal round uh with a 4 million check uh we uh, had a journey of about uh two years with with the quicksilver where we actually helped them open their russia operations uh, my partner who was on the on the deal actually helped hire the first russian head for quicksilver uh, uh, and then launched the russian operations uh, that operation scaled to a certain degree but uh, while we personally wanted to stay on uh, in this investment for over a longer period of time i think pine labs came calling and you know how exits work right you don't really go sell a company companies get bought so when uh, when pine labs came call came calling it seemed like the right uh, space time stage to exit that company at the right valuation so we were invested all of two years in this company and we ended up making a decent ir actually a pretty good ir on the, on our investment that's awesome so if you can share for our listeners what was uh quicksil was revenue so that that can be a learning from that exit uh see they were actually uh, at that at the point of exit um, they were they had a throughput of almost a billion dollars uh, which is all value of gift card solutions flowing through the systems that they built was uh, was about a billion dollars uh, and their uh take rate or or revenue on that was uh, was early single digits and but you know these are tech businesses so a lot of that flows to the to the bottom line so uh, this was one of the companies uh, where very early on they turned profitable uh, and not just at a monthly level but at a pat level they were profitable so high scale and profitable profitability were really uh, what uh, what got them sold in the market so this could have potentially been a billion dollar business had it not been bought well um, you know that's not how managed services businesses get valued uh, uh, i think the multiple we got was a fairly decent multiple from pine labs uh, they like i said they were already 90% of the market billion dollars was the throughput but the commissions the revenues that they make on that throughput was uh, you know early early double digits so from that standpoint uh, Uh, this was uh, this was the this was a very decent valuation that the company got a uh, billion dollar would have happened had they launched their own b2c brand and uh, i mean they launched their b2c brand but if they had scaled their b2c brand and uh, you know basically uh, scaled that part of the business then one could have seen a billion dollar opportunity but they were largely on the managed services business and so this was a great outcome for all the investors fantastic so you are part of two food businesses one is rebel foods popularly known as fazoos and the second is delicious can you tell us about your journey at what stage you entered the company and why did you feel so strongly that these businesses you know would become today what they are especially fazoos today is about to hit i believe a billion dollars in valuation that's right so uh, so sort of rebel foods or fazoos is a fairly old company uh, they've had about 8 10 years journey from the time they started but when we came in uh, it was a very pivotal moment for the company they had transitioned from 
really they were or they were transitioning from uh, fasos which is their own brand uh, to a cloud kitchen platform and what we liked was that uh, you know on the back of these cloud kitchens or dark kitchens or internet kitchens call them whatever you could leverage the economies of scale in terms of sourcing infrastructure people etc and launch multiple brands in the market so they uh, when we came in and we came in fairly late in this company um, we came in at uh, uh, at a series c stage uh, but uh, but it was the right time because you know they were just stepping the pedal on the cloud kitchen story they had about 120 plus cloud kitchens in the market uh, and they had launched about four brands so we could see the evidence that you know uh, you could how you could leverage the back end infrastructure and keep launching multiple uh, lines of cuisines from the same kitchen so so that's something we felt was highly scalable and uh, we also felt that uh, this is a team that really understands how to scale this business not just uh, locally but they had also international aspirations and uh, and after we've come in uh you know the company launched uh an international expansion as well and they had the right strategy to do that instead of putting feet on the ground they actually partnered with grab to launch it in uh, in the southeast asian market so so that has happened uh the company has attracted uh, top tier institutional investors after our round and yeah it's on uh, it's on a good track to be the next unicorn uh out of the country of course covid has uh uh you know uh, re- reset some of that business because a lot of uh, cities were under lockdown and some cities had uh, some states like maharashtra had pretty draconian lockdown so their business did suffer during that lockdown but we feel very confident about um, the the scalable model that they've built Uh, they you know they have scaled from 120 cloud kitchens to almost 300 cloud kitchens in the country now so as soon as the lockdown ends we're pretty confident that the scalability will be back and they can scale uh, the business uh, to the, to to the right scale i think uh, uh, licious is something we feel very strongly about that's the next food tech investment that we did and we came in fairly early in that company we took a early series b bet uh, this was 2017 Uh, what we liked about licious was that they were organizing a highly unorganized and fragmented market where almost 90% of the meat is sold through local butchers or the wet market and there is no uh, focus on hygiene quality uh, disease etc and there is also a taboo in terms of you know going to the local wet market and and buying your meat this in a country where 70% plus of uh, indians actually eat meat so we like the story where uh, both the founders uh, wanted to create a pan india brand in the fresh meat category and um, and uh, so we we came in uh, in licious uh, by based on that story what we also liked was that uh, you know to be able to build a brand and to control quality they had to go full stack and they were thinking um, in the same direction ie they were sourcing the right kind of meat from the right integrators in the market for which they had entered into partnerships uh, they were transporting that meat in uh, in cold storage trucks the meat would come to their own processing plant where there it would be cleaned and cut in the right manner so there's a science behind how you clean clean and do quality check and cut and hang at the right temperature and then they had built a bunch of delivery centers through which their own delivery staff uh, will pick up the meat and deliver it uh, to the customer's doorstep in 90 minutes so uh, we like the supply chain that they built end to end and we like the aspiration of building a pan india brand and we took the bet we came in series b and we you know and we've uh, participated in that company in series c d and e and continue to be very bullish 
uh, about the opportunity. Actually, they are uh, one of the companies in our portfolio which has seen strong tailwinds during COVID. Their business has actually doubled between April and May uh, because they've been the de facto provider of meat uh, across the seven cities in which they operate. And I believe you entered when it was a ten million dollar Series B, and yeah, it was a ten million dollar Series B round. Yes, and the the company has since raised you know Series C, Series D, Series E as you mentioned. Yes, the latest one was a thirty million dollar round. Yes, latest one was thirty million by Vertex Growth. Wow, that 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 has been a fantastic journey. Thank you. And 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 now uh, from uh, you know lens on the fintech side of your portfolio, lending cart and Kisht. Uh, how are these companies doing in times of COVID? Uh, there's a report that you know lending is slowing down in the market, and there's a lot of conundrum on the bank side, on the RBI side. Uh, would would love to have your thesis on these two investments and the general fintech sentiment in the market. See, uh, uh, you know, the NBFC sector has actually witnessed four mega shocks in the last 12 months, uh, starting from ILFS, then DHFL, then Yes Bank, and then COVID, which has resulted in two back-to-back moratoriums. So the story for NBFC businesses hasn't been very positive, unfortunately. Um, uh, What that has led to is, uh, you know, cost of capital certainly has gone up by 100 to 200 basis points. Availability of capital has been a challenge. Uh, and, uh, and you know, because of lockdowns uh, due to COVID, uh, just collections became a, a problem for all companies, not just our portfolio, but, you know, established companies like Bajaj Finance as well. So what our companies decided uh, to do during COVID was to pause disbursements because uh, unless you can collect, there's no point uh, disbursing capital. And they reallocated a bunch of their uh, resources to telecollections. Uh, I think on lending card, we are uh, we were surprised to see the numbers that uh, even in spite of uh, COVID, their average daily collections numbers stack up very nicely uh, in the market. And I think uh, given what we benchmarked against competitors, they are probably best in class in terms of collections. So while the new disbursements have paused, uh we are just waiting for the lockdowns to end i think on the demand side there has been no constraint at all uh smes want this working capital uh and they have no other option uh to tap into uh banks structurally cannot give small ticket loans it just doesn't work out as an economic um, economically for them so the alternative is a local money lender but if you have a digital lender that can service you in the right economics and make the product profitable, then uh, then that works out better for everybody. So we are uh, we are just waiting for uh, uh, for the lockdown to end and the economy to pick up for these companies to restart disburses. Uh, thankfully, both of them have enough capital to tide over the next twelve to fifteen months. But we are hoping uh, once the uh, once the uh, economy opens up, disbursals begin, the flywheel starts, uh, you know, they should slowly get back to uh, to their run rate. I think this year, for all practical purposes, will be a washout year. Uh, so, uh, so what they were doing last year, if they can get to that number by FI21, you know, they are actually in a pretty good position. So, so we feel strongly uh, about lending card. I think they really have built some key digital assets uh, and uh, and you know they should come back uh, once the market picks up on kish uh, i think the consumer internet uh, consumer finance story is actually more severe than the sme finance story uh, average daily collections are down certainly in the market and uh, and people and nbfcs across the board are feeling the pain uh, thankfully this company has taken the right cost measures early on uh, they are uh, you know tapping the right rbi lines to get more liquidity they have enough cash in the bank and uh, and uh, you know so they are they are also okay in terms of uh, you know restarting the business once uh, once the lockdown eases my view on lending is that uh, 
you know the last 10 years of nbfc ride uh will certainly see some re-rating the power of balance uh, uh, may be shifting back to banks however said that uh, having said that i still feel good nbfcs with fundamentally strong unit economics and business models will continue to survive and scale and we feel strongly about our portfolio um uh nbfs uh, lending card is actually a systematically important nbfc and uh, and they are in a very nice sweet spot where they continue to they will continue to lend to SP, smes and they are a pure sme focused nbfc so they have not diluted their core focus and and similarly kish we feel very strongly about the team uh, and their ability to navigate these troubled times so we'll see how the uh, nbfc market shapes up i think there'll be a re-rating smaller nbfcs will struggle to survive and raise capital uh, and uh, but the good ones the fundamentally strong ones will be able to uh, to emerge stronger from from the ashes thanks for sharing your insights through on the fintech market uh, healthcare has been a very good sector again for you just like uh, food tech you have two companies they are netmeds and healthify me there has been a recent news of you know netmeds getting acquired by reliance geo for 130 140 million dollars and uh, healthify me has also been doing well can, can you share more light on you know uh, when you entered those companies how has your journey been in health tech sure so uh, healthify me like uh, you know we were discussing healthify me is uh, is uh, a company that where we uh, pretty much ended up leading that round uh, this was a series a c round the company at that point in time was still focused uh, on uh, a human model of offering advice around nutrition so they had nutritionists uh, on their panel and people could call up and uh, you know they would get their advice i think what they've done beautifully is transition from a human centric model to an ai centric model uh, where now uh, you know technology can help you guide uh, and uh, reach your uh, reach your goal uh, they've uh, actually seen strong tailwinds in this market people are sitting at home they're focused on health and we have seen a lot of downloads uh, and activity on the health uh, healthify me app so we are seeing strong uh, momentum in this market uh we believe this is a business that can certainly go international the company has plans to uh take this to southeast asia while india market is deep uh, uh we have plans to take this to in, uh, to uh, to southeast asia monetization on this uh, business is doing fairly well uh we like i said came in series c we've had one round after that and the company will hit the market for a large round uh in a few months uh because they want to capitalize on the momentum that they've built so that's on healthify me on on netmeds uh you know we actually met all the companies in the pharmacy space what we liked was like i said we have this inclination towards full stack models so the thing the beauty about netmeds was that uh, while they were running the e pharmacy part of the business they also had the distribution stack in place and as a result of uh, you know managing both front end retail and back end distribution their margin structures were probably the most healthy in the industry so that was our thesis uh, in backing uh, netmeds we came in uh, i think this was a, a series c round where we put in 5 bucks to come in into the company and uh, we've had a bunch of rounds after that and you know and the latest news is uh, is what you just alluded to i cannot comment more on that because the transaction is still in the works but uh, but that's where it stands wow so so i believe all the companies in your portfolio of 10 are doing well except one you know which uh, which is woopla uh, can you share your learnings from woopla why you too early on in that market yeah uh, uh so woopla uh, you know is something i actually worked on at helion as well so i was very close to that transaction and then uh, when i came to systema i felt very strongly about that model and so i ended up uh, backing that company at uh, at systema as well uh 
they were initially i mean they went through multiple pivots right but but eventually what they ended up with was a social commerce model and uh, and they from what i have looked and understood from the market had probably the best economics in terms of uh, you know just running the social uh, e- social commerce model uh, they uh, were contribution margin positive uh, they were scaling very nicely. They had gone from literally two million to uh, thirty million in a matter of a month, in a matter of twelve months. Uh, unfortunately, they struggled to raise capital. I think the competitive intensity in the market had uh, had certainly increased, and uh, our ability to support the company going forward was limited. Uh, and uh, they had two term sheets that fell through. So unfortunately for the company, it happened at the wrong time. And so the founders decided that, uh, you know, given the capital this business would require to scale uh, and the fact that the capital was not coming, it was a hard decision to wind down the company. So uh, I don't think it was too early or too late. I think the founders were savvy enough to transition the model from a content commerce led model to a social commerce led model early on even before some of the other names got very popular so they were certainly ahead of the game uh, it's the nature of the business that uh, you know uh, some mortalities do happen and we were unfortunate that we weren't able to raise capital uh, for this company so it ended up uh, it ended up winding down operations group uh, going forward you know the, in the post covid world what are the sectors system is now bullish about in 2020 and 2021? Because a lot of uh, consumer and enterprise behavior will change. Yeah. So I think uh, we are still studying the long-term impact of COVID. Uh, I think if you look at China and from what we understand, some of the metrics are back to pre-COVID levels, i.e., uh, you know, people are back in restaurants, uh, people are traveling, uh, people are, are going to movie theaters, etc., etc. So if that were to happen in India, then I'm not sure what will fundamentally change. However, uh, in, in terms of, you know, fundamental business models, but there will be some impact and we are still studying uh, the impact of that. I think uh, visibly where we stand today, a uh, few sectors that certainly have uh, experienced renewed interest. One is edtech. This was a sector where we have uh, been tracking for a long time, but just didn't have the confidence uh, to pull the trigger. But now in the post-COVID world, we feel there will be renewed vigor uh, to focus on this sector. So edtech is something we are certainly bullish about. Uh, health tech uh, is another one. While we have uh, two investments there we want to broad base our focus there and third uh, is uh, agri-tech that's a sector where you know it's one large sector that is getting disrupted by technology and uh, we've looked at most of the companies we're bullish on a few we're tracking them so that's uh, another sector where we want to take some bets in addition uh, 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 SaaS and enterprise software are areas where we will continue to focus on. What we didn't talk about is that four of our portfolio companies or three are in the enterprise software space. We have a company called Unifor, uh, which is a AI company that has solutions for call center operations. It's started out of Chennai, now is pretty much a global company, doing very well. Uh, we have Seclor and we have Mobicon. Uh, as two other SaaS companies. So uh, uh, domestic SaaS is something we are increasingly getting bullish on. So that's an area we will look at. So those were the sectors uh, of focus. I think where we will be you know, cautious on our e-commerce or vertical commerce, uh, maybe we'll uh, cautiously look at that sector. And uh, uh, you know, more of lending uh, will be again something we look at carefully we have a fairly exposed portfolio in terms of lending so pure lending maybe not but other areas in fintech is something we'd look at so can can you share uh, more light about the enterprise companies of yours especially unifo because that has recently raised a very large round 
from March capital in US and been expanding very quickly. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it, uh, like I said, uh, Unifor is a company that started out of Chennai. It's, uh, it's a fairly old company funded by Chirate uh, Ventures. And we came in, uh, again, uh, in this recent round that March Capital led. It was a 50 million round and we came in with five bucks. Um, uh, this is a company that uh, is a pioneer in using artificial intelligence for call center operations. Uh, globally, so it's a $300 billion market that they're targeting. They managed to raise, uh, actually get John Chambers, ex-CEO of Cisco, on their uh, on their cap table. He personally invested in that company. And he's on the board and he's guiding the company uh, pretty much on a, on a regular basis. The company is now transitioned to the U.S., i.e. the founder sits in the U.S., and he's built a strong leadership team with him in the U.S. So now they are targeting global markets sitting out of U.S. Chennai continues to be their tech center. Um, uh, they are, uh, like I said, they're scaling very well. Uh, we are fairly bullish on this company. We would double down in the next rounds. Uh, so these are opportunities, uh, you know, uh, that we will continue to look at companies emerging out of India, but targeting either global markets, uh, i.e. U.S. for that matter, or uh, Europe and Southeast Asia. Uh, the stage that we like to come in are, uh, or is uh, where a company has proven uh, some international uh, revenue stream, i.e. 20-30% of the revenues are coming from the U.S. And with our capital, they can actually expand that further in, in, in these markets. So that's that's the position that we like, and uh, and uh, and we'll continue to look for more companies in that area. And and what about Seclor and Mobicon? What areas they are in, and what stage you came in, and how are they doing right now? Once you partnered with them, Seclor was the first deal Systema did. Uh, this is an information rights management product that was funded by uh, previously funded by Venture East uh, and Helion. And uh, this company, again, uh, uh, you know, targets large government enterprises in uh, India, uh, large manufacturing setups uh, in China and, South and, uh, and Europe. And they have an office in the U.S. where they target U.S. customers. Essentially, what they do is provide you the ability to, uh, 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 you know, Provide, put a layer of security at the document level so that you can only share it uh, with the relevant persons, uh, etc. And uh, we came in at, uh, at a Series B stage in this company. This was one of the early checks in the company. We've supported the company over time. They are probably at a double-digit ARR number at this moment. Uh, uh, we continue to support it. Uh, founder... Uh, transitions back and forth between US and India. This is a Mumbai-based company. So, uh, so yeah. So that's uh, on uh, on uh, Seclor and Mobicon is uh, our first Southeast Asia investment. This is a uh, a company that uh, focuses uh, provides a CRM solution for FNB outlets in India and six countries of Southeast Asia. Uh, uh, they we what we liked. Uh, was that uh, you know while the tech center is based or the technology people are based in India, a lot of their revenues come from Southeast Asia, and this is a founder who had been operating in the FNB space for all his life. Uh, we did a Series B in this company along with a bunch of Singapore investors, and uh, then they managed to raise a round uh, from BTB Ventures, which is Billy Bansal's fund. And they continue to focus uh, on on the sort of broader Southeast Asia plus India market. And, and uh, you know, uh, uh, having such a diverse portfolio, right? You mentioned edtech is one sector you are looking at. So, so, so can you share some of your deep thesis on edtech? What kind of models do you think will work in India? Till now, there have been only a, a handful of companies like. Baiju, Unacademy, Topper, Vedantu that have been uh, able to scale, uh, I would say, to a, a 
at least you know uh, near uh, some of them are near billion dollar valuations some of them have crossed 100 million dollar valuations and are monetizing well so what what's your deep thesis what will work in india and what will work for you yeah so uh, you know we've like i said we have been tracking the sector for a while and for the right reasons that you mentioned we've also stayed away because we worried about monetization we also worried about the fact that this is a fairly regulated sector so higher ed is regulated k12 is regulated the opportunities lie within uh, you know coaching for test prep for entrance examination which is a fairly competitive industry or market and uh, and then uh, tutoring for k12 which is an emerging area and then the other sector is preschool which is largely uh, franchisee driven model etc etc so uh, i think uh the uh, the engagement levels and the scale that companies like vedantu uh an academy topper etc are seeing gives us uh the encouragement that uh, you know during these times uh if you can build the right technology and link uh, students on one side and delivery individuals on the other side uh there is uh, there is value to be created in the chain and then you can think of monetizing this through parents etc or through education institutions so what we like is uh, the k12 tutoring space uh, which is still nascent but uh, you know it is getting competitive uh, we like the coaching for entrance examination uh, potentially not iit je because that is fairly crowded but other examinations uh bank po ias etc etc so there is a, a a bunch of examinations for which you can build and then uh, you know after school uh, a concept concept building based uh, uh uh models so focused on building foundations in mathematics or science etc so those are areas uh, that we potentially like but like i said uh, we are still uh, uh, evaluating this deeply i think this sector has got a lot of renewed focus because of covid uh, physical institutions are start are shut downs and the only way to impart education is through digital so so those are at least high level areas where we will focus on in edtech uh, thanks ruf for sharing your insights uh, now coming to some personal side of yours you have been a venture capitalist for quite a long time what what habits do you attribute to your success seeing your very high success ratio <laughs> so uh, uh, you know success is uh, a relative term i think venture is a long gestation uh, profession and uh, success in that in this is fairly back ended so uh, i would i would say that you know uh, success for me would is still 5 years away when i actually see a uh, hard cash exit for the companies that i've invested in but i think uh, one of the attributes uh, you know that at least i focus on is just fairly disciplined investing and that has uh, potentially held us in good stead even in this time so for example when we started systema i think our investment philosophy that we chalked out was that we will not invest in flavor of the season business we will not invest behind high burn businesses we will like to invest behind high gross margin businesses where margin of safety is uh, fairly significant so thin uh, margin businesses which depend on volumes is something we will not be able to support and uh, and our capital should help the company get to break even and uh, or at least there should be a path to break even uh, where uh, we can achieve the break company level break even with our capital so these four or five traits is something we have deployed across our portfolio and we've looked at all the companies through this lens and uh, you know i think that has held us uh, as a fund in good stead so our portfolio is uh, fairly robust we you know except for fintech where structurally uh, there are some headwinds most of the other companies have actually seen tailwinds uh, even during covid time so we feel very good about that that we've uh, you know stuck to our netting 
uh, what we what we said um, early on at the time of uh, you know as part of the fund charter we have stuck to that so i you know if it boils down to one thing i would just say that you know just discipline investing is really uh, what we what has helped us uh, build this portfolio but but there would have been some messages also you with companies which you have tracked closely both at helion and there was opportunity at systema to participate in them because you were close to them and you miss could you like to share you know some of these companies no absolutely i think um, uh, uh, two companies that come to mind that uh, we were you know we really liked but for whatever reason ended up invest uh, missing them at systema um, one is you know ninja card i think they are doing something uh, exceptional in the agri tech space the supply chain that they have built really is disrupting the way uh, fruits and vegetables reach retailers i think we looked at them in multiple stages but uh, felt the operational intensity of that business was fairly high and for whatever reason we could not pull the trigger so that one we feel uh, uh like we we let it pass uh, for the wrong reason perhaps and uh, the other one uh, you know again um, uh, is in the lending space a company called rupee uh, rupeek this is a gold gold loan company uh, very strong model uh, very unique in their value proposition uh, very solid founder um, we missed it the first time around it came back to us but by then we felt it was uh, a little bit too expensive for us to participate in so you know it's this is the nature of business you prioritize some deals um and some will slip through the cracks uh, we'll see how these play out but yeah at this point these two certainly uh, do strike as something uh, we which we were close to investing but we ended up missing at the at at, the, at that stage thank you so much dhruv it's been wonderful to have this conversation with you thank you for sharing your experiences and insights sadar thank you so much i had a great time chatting with you